You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible in Atlanta over the weekend. A local armed black militia made headlines on the 4th of July by challenging the KKK during a march from the city of Stone Mountain to Stone Mountain Park. Of course, uh, that's where, of course, there is this huge, this huge mural, if you will, uh, etched into stone there uh, of these uh, Confederates. The militia calls itself not the not fucking around coalition. Watch this. Now, the leader said the march was the result of threats made against blacks by members of the KKK and other white supremacist groups. Grandmaster Jay, founder of the group, joins me now on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, Grandmaster Jay, how you doing? Roland, good to be here. How are you? Doing great. First and foremost, uh, how many folks did you have out there? We had a total of 1,500 that were in the formation, and then we had a lot of folks that were unable to carry weapons but still were in uniform that numbered about another 150. And then, of course, you had a volume of spectators that wanted to trail along to see what was going to happen. They numbered at about another 150. So you, um, how, how long did it take for you to coordinate this? Uh, and, and, and was it also meant uh, to let folks know, not just in Atlanta, but around the country, uh, that there are African Americans today, in many ways, who were like the deacons of the defense in the 1960s, uh, who protected black communities from, uh, from the KKK? I would answer that in a twofold answer. First, it was it had a twofold purpose. If you remember, with the uh, with the murder of Ahmaud Arbery in Brunswick, Georgia, uh, those were our members that showed up uh, armed, the armed citizens you heard about. That was our first uh, foray into this matter that has gotten completely out of control with violence happening at the hands of, I hate to say it, white Americans against what appears to be predominantly black Americans, not saying other people don't get shot, but for uh, for the racial piece to be added in there on top of everything else that we've been going through with the quarantine, the, the pandemic and so forth, loss of jobs, and of course the, the, tension, the tension being risen in the country, that we had reached a point that even though we had gone through all of that, uh, there was a remnant of us that's been in place for quite some time. Uh, we're, we're the older guys, we're the mature guys, we're your vets, we're your, we're your folks who are responsible gun owners. We're the individuals that, you know, we remember the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and now here in the 20s, we're trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Uh, we, we, we know the law, we're law-abiding gun, gun owners, so we understand the Constitution. And of course, we all believe in the Second Amendment of the Constitution and the First Amendment. So. Uh, the first show of force was pretty much just to let folks know that uh, this is not the way that we want to see things progress. But if they do, we're going to have to uh, take Malcolm X's words and defend ourselves against these uh, continued attacks. So we decided to do two things. The first thing was uh, to exercise our constitutional right uh, to bear arms uh, in accordance with the law and, of course, to peacefully assemble. And then at the same time, send what we felt was a message to the heart of what we feel is probably the driving engine behind a lot of what is now coming to light. Uh, the FBI report that said that there would be an insurgence of white supremacists and those folks into law enforcement, into the military, had begun to, to bear fruit. We're seeing that in the increased numbers of uh, police-involved shootings. We're also starting to see certain behaviors that are not so much related to police, but are related to the Jim Crow era and, and related to the era of lynching. Uh, a spate of lynchings across the country that no one seems to want to explain, like all of a sudden black men became experts on how to tie nooses and jump off of trees all of a sudden, when the history that we have within our culture is that hanging is the last thing that a black man is going to think about doing, not taking anything away from suicide rates, which we studied. But in this particular instance, given the atmosphere that we were seeing, with the resurgence of what appears to be very evident white militia that the police are unwilling to even so much as detain as they do black folks. Uh, with the rise in the protest that happened after uh, George Floyd, and then again the increased uh, presence of what we could only deem as uh, agitators, dressed like police but heavily armed, uh, we thought it would be in our best interest to send a message to the heart of what we believe is the driving engine behind that, the KKK. 
the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, what we found out when we dealt with the McMichaels and the, Mr. Bryan down in Brunswick is that they were all members of the same Klan Lodge, uh, which told us, we talk, spoke volumes. And when we found out that the, uh, the, most of the folks in the town were okay with that, we know about the Deep South. Well, in this particular instance, uh, Stone Mountain represents the birthplace or the rebirth place of the Ku Klux Klan. So we decided to do something that had never been done before. And that was to peacefully assemble a formation, uh, not a mob, not, not a bunch of protesters, not a demonstration, but to call a formation of our black militia, which is what we are, and to actually go up to the mountain and uh, make a statement uh, that we wanted to make under the first Constitution, under the First Amendment to the Constitution, and then leave. That was the intention. Uh, in the process of us planning this, here comes the threat. And this threat was communicated by major media, communicated by the White House, Department of Justice. So uh, we took it at face value, even though uh, we hadn't seen anything of some of these other threats. Uh, you were not going to continue to threaten the black race. It was not going to happen. And it was time for us to show folks that you know, we can defend ourselves. There's been a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, where folks are trying to paint us as a terrorist group or that we're, we're, we're out to attack folks. And, you know, no, that's not the purpose. The purpose was to send the message. The message was sent uh, very well. And we also demonstrated that we could organize ourselves in such a fashion that no one got hurt. Uh, there were no incidences of anyone accidentally killing themselves. Uh, there was no property damage. Uh, there were some exchanges of words uh, between some of the folks who were made to leave the park. Uh, folks don't understand that the law enforcement evacuated the park when we came. And they closed the park for us to avoid any conflict. So it was a very peaceful event. As a matter of fact, it was a history-making event because it happened simultaneously with another march that we had uh, in Phoenix, Arizona at the exact same time. This was a message to all of the white militia and to all of the folks who continue to believe that you can treat black folks any particular type of way and that we will not stand up as U.S. citizens and arm ourselves per the Constitution. When you are on that particular point there, I mean, we have seen all of these different uh, we've seen all of these different um, um, white uh, militia groups uh, come out mad protesting. They don't have. Uh, you know, they, they don't want to wear masks, things along those lines, uh, and, 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 and storming state capitals. What I've said to people that when I see this video, the actions of these black folks totally different than what I've seen for some of these white protesters in Michigan and Wisconsin. I mean, Absolutely. And, but people all say, oh, my God, because, again, we know how America is, as we always say it. America freaks the hell out when black folks with guns show up in public. Well, well, you have to understand something, Roland. If you've read the book Brainwashed by Tom Burrell, it talks a lot about... Oh, yeah. I actually, I, I actually interviewed Tom Burrell, so know him well. Great book, great book. He actually talks about a lot of the behaviors that have been ingrained into certain cultures so that automatically, by default, we automatically assume something to be wrong, even if it's not against the law. And one of the things that he talks about in that book is the fact that African Americans have been socialized to believe that the presence of guns is an evil thing. And that's why uh, the, the image of the black man uh, being the evil uh, crime marauding across the, you know, rape, robbing and pillaging as if this is a birth of a new nation uh, has been ingrained on both sides of the, of the fence. However, when white folks decide they want to pick up guns and, and run up on state houses and, and threaten police and nothing happens, black folks see that and go, well, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And, and as you all know, it's no fun when the rabbit has the gun. So uh, to be honest with you, uh, we again are, are, are not a mob uh, and we're not, we're not talking about something that we feel about. We're looking at a situation that is deteriorating and we feel we have to defend ourselves. Our policing models are broken. Remote policing does not work. Uh, we feel there's a need for us to get back to community policing. We feel there's a need for us to start protecting our own communities again under the laws that are established in the land and also the, 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 the educating of our own people. Not just gun clubs, but the actual ability that a gun is necessary for you to have on your person legally in this apartheid-like environment that we live in in the United States. Well, and the reality is, which I've said to people, that if you choose not to, you don't have to. Uh, look, I fired a gun one time at the FBI Academy. It was a, a submachine <laughs> gun. I was a grossly overrated experience. So I was like, yo, I'll go back to playing golf. But... If somebody, if somebody, I mean, that's just, that's just me. And so I've never, my family has never had one in our household. That's just me. I don't need to have one. My brother, he go, he's gone out hunting with his son and his daughter. Great. Uh, and again, but, but, but the thing though is we also understand the history when those black Panthers rolled up in the state capitol in Sacramento, then white legislators freaked the hell out, uh, and immediately, uh, moved against that. And in fact, if you also take it even further, 
uh, to even go back the creation of the NRA and creation. I mean, bottom line is you, you, white folks in this country have always had a response to black resistance by, grab, by, by grabbing guns. And what well, I let, me, let, me, let me throw something in there, Roland. Here's the deal. There, there's two things that we have to address before we can go any further. The first thing is, is that it, the double standard. You know, the hypocrisy of it's all. Uh, white right. militia marches, nobody says anything. A couple of guys get locked up in Virginia for impersonating police officers with twisty ties to throw somebody in a truck and go lynch him. Nobody says anything. Black folks assemble to peacefully a march to a, to a notoriously controversial landmark, may say a few words under the, under the First Amendment rights, and all of a sudden, I mean, I've seen the headlines around the world, everything from anti-Semitic, which we're not, uh, to we're, we're out to attack white folks, to we're trying to take Texas. Texas is already geared <laughs> up for an invasion. You heard of getting ready. Uh, people are telling us to come on down. Let's duke it out. And we're like, that's not what we said. Well, but here's so, the deal, though. For the folks who don't understand in Texas, uh, the new Black Panther Party, look, I, I, I covered those guys in Dallas. And I, rem I remember being there. People like, oh, my God, these black people with guns. the point is, we're but, but, not taking Texas. No, 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 no. No, but, but, no, but follow, no, follow me here. What I'm saying is I'm born and raised there. I was covering those sure. guys in Dallas. People were sure. freaking out. And I'm sitting there going, Tape, wait a minute. Uh, black folks walking around with weapons, because I mean, I was there when Khalid Muhammad was with them. They went to right. the James Bird uh, when they went there and they had their guns. And people were freaking out. And I was like, yo, the white folks over there got their guns. Open carry state. Open. It doesn't say open carry for white people. It says open carry. Open carry. Exactly. Now, now, here's the second part. And this is the part where I've been waiting to say this to you. I want to I want to thank you. Because you are the first person in black news media who saw fit to have a conversation with us about a historic event that has happened that has been ignored by mainstream media. Uh, it has been ignored, especially by black media. And believe it or not, most folks are hearing one twisted version or another. So folks were wondering when were you guys going to show up? And I wanted to thank you, Roland, because I, someone said, you know, Roland wants to wants to have you come on. I'm like, what, you mean Roland Martin? Someone finally spoke up. Roland, I, I have to tell you that you, I have newfound respect for you. After the comedy show you put on on um, on um, on, um, on Monique's page, Monique Presley's page, uh, I thought that that was hilarious. I knew, didn't know you could be so funny. But now you have my newfound respect in journalism again. And I want to thank you for being the first black uh, news media outlet of major proportions that actually have the in fact come on, discuss it, what, what we were doing, why we were doing it, and to and to speak from the perspective of the black citizen. Because I had so uh, there are people who are commenting on on Periscope. I see them on Facebook and YouTube uh, as well. And so uh, one of the things that I saw one particular comment the folks wanted to get wanted to get from you is that we've we've seen the shootings that have taken place in Atlanta, the eight year old girl being killed as well. Um, and one of the one of the folks who said, should there also be this presence in protecting African-Americans in cases like that? W what is your comment to that? You know, it's, it's kind of ironic that they asked that question, because once we completed uh, the march on Stone Mountain and we were done and we had been escorted out of the park, uh, we actually went down to the Wendy's uh, where Richard Brooks was killed. And uh, we met with the young men that were out there guarding the place, and they asked us for pointers. And one of the guys even said when we got there, Where, what took you guys so long to get here? And we walked around, and they showed us the place. They showed us the stores. And we told them, you guys want to get some training. You guys want to, you know, if you want to do this, you got to do it right. And everything was great. And then we left to escort Rashad Brooks' sister down to Centennial Park uh, to a reparations rally. She asked us to be her security. And while we were down there, you know, again, it was a great time. And then we left. We're smart enough not to hang around any town after sunset. We're not that stupid. So we were long gone. We're not from Georgia. Uh, some of us were, but we all didn't know that we should disappear. And then to hear what happened later, uh, the shooting and so forth, was distressing us because it was right where we was. And we kind of felt like, at first we thought it was, you know, someone was trying to be retaliatory because we were there. Uh, because the young men did tell us that the Ku Klux Klan had come by and shot up the place a couple of nights before. But then again, I can tell you now that the state of things in Atlanta at that time, there was lawlessness not just in that area, it was throughout the city. You know, we saw a decreased police presence, uh, and we saw a lot of folks who were taking advantage of that. So the, the, the hearing of that shooting distressed us. But what probably uh, incensed me even more was the fact that uh, there was not a structure like us in place that was already doing community policing. Because now that we've got a photograph and a videotape of the young man, uh, that's obviously not even qualified to be in the NFAC. We are an old folks organization. There are no young kids 
per se in our organization. Now that we've got a video of what this young man looks like, and we know there are three or four other suspects involved, we too have gone public to demand that that individual be turned over by the community uh, so that they can be dealt with because that is inexcusable. And yes, we do believe that is another justification for us to have our own community policing as opposed to remote policing because those folks know who's in their neighborhood. So I do support that, and that is one of the tenets of the NFAC. And you're speaking about the shooting death of Sicoria Turner. Uh, folks, go to my iPad. This is the photo that authorities released. Uh, they are looking to question this individual uh, in uh, that particular shooting. Uh, of course, we also uh, have, uh, there were several Af young black kids who were killed in Chicago over the weekend as well. Uh, last question for you and I've got a people I've seen I'm reading comments uh, from people who literally are commenting right now on Facebook uh, to the people who normally watch it on YouTube channel we've had we're having some issues there is buffering so my apologies there so if you got a problem with our YouTube channel go to our Facebook page or our Periscope page because we're streaming on all three uh, so Grandmaster Jay the question to you is folks are saying um, do you have chapters in other cities and if so is there a central location where people can go to get more information? Uh, they also want to know about starting chapters in their own place as well under your group's banner. They want to know where do they get information? Absolutely. Uh, anyone who is, there, there are two, two answers. Anyone who's interested in becoming a member of InFact, um, you can go to in, info at blacknfac.com. I'll say it again, info at black. NFAC.com and give us your contact information. There is a vetting process uh, and some of those they have to do with the ability to own guns and attain or carry concealed. So you know your own your own background. So you know, act accordingly. Uh, the other if you want information on the group itself, uh, you can either come directly to me myself and through our, our portal on Instagram. That's my official Instagram account. That's the official Grandmaster J on Instagram for the time being. Instagram is censoring us very heavily these days, as is Facebook. So we're looking at moving to other platforms. I am here on YouTube, but my YouTube may become the new place. But for right now, we are controlling the flow of information, Roland. Uh, we're controlling it because we learned our lessons from COINTELPRO. We learned our lessons from Operation Black Messiah. We've learned our lessons. So we're not as openly uh, with our information as some organizations are. We are a militia. Uh, so we have to protect that information so we control the, the, the input of whatever uh, that comes in. Additionally, anyone uh, who's curious about chapters, there are chapters around the country. We're still birthing chapters. As a matter of fact, the young man in Louisiana uh, that, that they had the run in last week, uh, him and I have talked several times about them becoming the Louisiana arm of the NFAC. Uh, if you already have a, a militia type organization in your city, feel free to reach out to us and then we can have a conversation and then we can talk about whether or not we append that because we are a coalition, uh, which means that we work along with different elements. However, our core group itself uh, is pretty large. Uh, so if you want to join the NFAC directly, that's what you saw in, in uh, Stone Mountain. Those were all NFAC. Uh, then you please feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, there is going to be an I'll end with this role. We're going to do a recruiting tour uh, where I am going to come to certain cities. And if you already have your chapter ready to go, I'll have my team with me. We'll inspect your your, your folks will make sure everybody's up to snuff and check documentation and then we'll swear you in and you are then officially a member of this of our particular organization what happened in stone mountain also is we swore in all of those people uh, they had come from many different places this was their final step uh, the two and a half mile road march up and down hills in the hot sun with all the quarantine food you ate was your was your final test to see if you could make it uh, into the nfac but that is our that that's that's all i have and i thank you for having me and I would hope that everyone realizes that we're setting an example of how you should respond in the ongoing face of aggression against the black community. Thank uh, you again, Roland. I uh, appreciate it. And again, for the folks uh, who are out there, I, I unfortunately, I do not have it with me, but it is on my uh, bookshelf at home. I'm trying to uh, actually uh, pull it up right now. Just give me a second. I want to. So, so for the folks who, again, who don't understand uh, history. Uh, this actually, uh, Lance Hill is the author uh, of a book. Go, go ahead and uh, go ahead and show this. Uh, the Deacons for Defense, Armed Resistance and the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and so you need to understand that particular book. Uh, and I'm going to pull up another book. Just give me a second uh, for folks who don't know. I actually interviewed him. He was one of the leaders, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, Charles Cobb. Uh, and Charles Cobb also wrote a book. Um, 
Uh, give me one second. And again, remember last week we were discussing this. Greg, Dr. Greg Carr showed you a particular book as well um, uh, that um, uh, uh, that, uh, that that dealt with the issue of the history of African Americans uh, and gun rights. Uh, Charles Cobb's book. I'm looking for the cover, uh, but uh, I think it was called uh, "This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed," and he was actually talking about again the the history of gun rights during the Black Freedom Movement. Grandmaster Jay, we surely appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Mr. Martin. Thank you. All right, folks. Back to our Mark unfiltered video in just one moment. All right, folks, the folks at Seek.com, they have, of course, uh, their virtual reality headset, which you can see right here, which allows for you to actually place your phone inside of this particular headset. Look at 360-degree video. Look at virtual reality video right there on your phone uh, as well. And so you can go to Seek.com and watch their content, subscribe to their content. You can also, of course, uh, check out other videos. There's a YouTube channel that has 360-degree video. Then, of course, they have their 360-degree 4D headphone. You see them right here. Uh, you, uh, gamers uh, also use these. This also, of course, has this uh, microphone that, right here that attaches to uh, the headset, which allows for you to talk. Uh, while you are playing video games, you'll see right here, the microphone right here. Uh, then, of course, you can also, it's Bluetooth, and you can also plug in, listen to music. If you uh, want a discount code to get these headsets, uh, this VR headset or the headphones, go to seek.com, C-E-E-K.com, seek.com, C-E-E-K.com, and use the promo code RMVIP2020, RMVIP2020. Uh, a black woman, Mary Spio, is actually the inventor uh, of these uh, headphones. She owns the company as well, and so, uh, not only are you supporting, uh, um, of course, a great product, but also supporting a black-owned business. And so we certainly appreciate that. So don't forget, uh, the promo code is RMVIP2020.